Our live stream will begin shortly. Before we jump into our service today, we wanted you to know that we have been praying for you. This time of uncertainty strikes each of us in different ways. We have been praying specifically that this time of worship through song and study would be used by God in your heart to remind you of His love for you and to empower you to share His love with those around you who are hurting. We also want to take a moment to acknowledge the awkwardness of worshiping in isolation instead of gathered together. As you sit alone or with your family at home during our service today, it may feel uncomfortable or distant, and it may be easy to get distracted. You may be tempted to just watch without singing along with the songs or without reading along in your copy of God's Word as Pastor teaches us. We want to invite you to put your reservations aside and participate wholeheartedly, just like you would if we were physically together. As Philippians 1.27 says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We can't wait to be able to be together again soon, but in the meantime, we know that God is everywhere and he sees us as one unified body, no matter where we are. Thank you for worshiping with us today. You are loved. Good morning, CB3. We are so excited to be worshiping with you, even though it looks very different this morning. We still encourage you to sing along with us from your couches or wherever it is that you are uh, tuning in and uh, sing along with us. Look up the words, pull up the lyrics, and um, let's sing together. Let's worship because no matter how far spread apart we are, God will still be praised. God is still good. He is worthy of our praise. And I wanted to share a verse with you this morning right before we sing it's from the book of psalms chapter 27 verses 13 through 14 and it says i remain confident of this i will see the goodness of the lord in the land of the living wait for the lord be strong and take heart and wait for the lord so let's keep that in mind this morning as we worship take heart be strong and wait for the lord Oh, 
together, singing together. Uh, like I said, it's unconventional. It's not, uh, it's not our usual. And it's okay if you've got your fur babies with you, if you've got the kids gathered around your phone. And uh, we just encourage you to keep singing along with us. <coughs> we know CHOP and radio are both excited to be <laughs> part of our church experience this morning. So um, I would encourage you to uh, to share with us. Either send it to the church through a message, or um, maybe we, maybe we'll make a post on the Facebook page to uh, share with us your worship space this morning. Show us where you are worshiping from. Is it your couch? Is it your back porch? Where are you worshiping from? Where where is church for you today? And um, I just think it's so cool. This is different and it's odd, but. It's so cool, the way that God has brought it all together. And I just wanted to share with you again, <clears throat> excuse me, another verse that's been ringing in my head, and I want to set the context a little bit. It comes from the book of John, chapter 1, right at the beginning. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In church, that's present tense. The light shines in the darkness right now. And the darkness has not overcome it right now, today. As we gather, as we worship, 
as we sing his praises, the darkness has not overcome the light of Jesus Christ. Let's keep singing together, church. <clears throat> Everyone needs compassion, the love that's never failing, but mercy
says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So church, as we sing one more song together, rest in that promise. We are all children of God, and because of the Spirit of God living in our hearts, we are not slaves to fear, but rather we have the privilege, the honor, the blessing of being able to cry out to God, Father, Father, would you save us? Father, would you heal us? Father, would you help us? How awesome that is. What a privilege. So church, we're going to sing one more song this morning. We're going to tune our hearts to a time of prayer, and you'll see the transition. Pastor Jim is going to be praying for us this morning. So let's sing. Let's rest in that promise. He is our Abba Father.
of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Amen. And as we come into this time of prayer, I just want to take a moment to remind you that you can send us your prayer requests. Um, if you go on our Facebook, you can click the message button and send us a prayer request that way. Or if you go to our website, cvfree.church forward slash prayers with an S, then you can leave prayer requests right on there. And what's really neat about that is you can either set it to become public so that people on can go to our website and see that and be praying for you, or you can set it to not share and then it will just come to us pastors. So let's take a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you. We praise you in the midst of this storm. You know, Lord, we don't know what this is going to look like from day to day, but we know that you're on the throne. We know that you have us. And Father, I pray as we move forward with this that we see a renewing. That we see a revival for you, Lord. We see a renewing in the family. As we're spending more time together and our busy lives are slowed down. That we connect with each other again. We take the time to really bond and to put you in the center of our family. And that, Lord, that we see renewal in our hearts, in our minds. And that, Father, we're examining ourselves and whatever we have that may be a barrier that we knock it down, Lord. Whatever it is that may be holding us back from you, that you illuminated it for us, Father, and that we set it at your feet. Father, I pray for renewal, for revival of your people. See people come to you in the midst of this, to seek you and to become new. Lord, we know that you can take a, a bad situation and make it amazing for your glory. Lord, we pray that today. We pray that you turn this situation around. That you use it how you want to use it. And if that means that we take that time with our families and the Father, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for your promise that you are always there. So that we always can reach out to you. And that you've got everything under control. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, CV Free Church and beyond. I mean, this is the cool thing about being on Facebook uh, officially and only is that we are saying hello to our regular church family and also I pray a whole bunch of new friends. So hello and uh, welcome. As we explore Easter upside down, certainly our worlds are being turned upside down. And it's funny because we selected that sermon series long ago, but it's become very relevant every day more and more. So here we are on week two, and it's actually part two of a look into Judas. Now, I don't know how much you know about Judas, but Actually, he ends up being really the poster child for betrayal in the Bible, which is an unfortunate title, but it has led to really the best news ever for us. And so it's one of those situations where God took something that the enemy wanted to use for evil and worked good out of it. And we're here today and able to have a solid foundation in Jesus because of Judas's betrayal. So I guess in some weird way, we are to be thankful for the fact that he betrayed Jesus. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at his journey together and see if we can wrap our minds around this. You know, ultimately, we come to this idea of how could someone who walked with Jesus was one of his apostles turn on him and really betray him, sell him, end up costing him his life? How does that happen? How do you have someone who you look to as one of your future 
um, protege is basically someone who's going to take your place and have that person t turn into someone who completely betrays you. That's what this story is really about. What it really came down to for Judas Iscariot were these two words, great expectations. He had it all figured out in his mind, how this was all going to come together. He knew exactly, he thought, how G Jesus was going to behave, what he was going to say, how people were going to respond to him. There was this grand plan in Judas's mind that he would absolutely be able to overthrow the Roman government. I mean, that was something that Jews were really looking for their Messiah to do because they wanted freedom, much like they had received freedom when they were led out of slavery back in Egypt. And so Judas's great expectations of the Messiah were completely misguided and ended up costing him the greatest missed opportunity in history. As I mentioned before, we're in retrospect glad that it worked out that way, but boy at the time he certainly ended up making choices that he came to regret and we'll learn more and more about that as we go on. I think it's important for you to know that Judas came from a lineage of freedom fighters that valued the Jewish heritage in zealous ways and he was raised in the heart of Judah in a place called Kirioth. So he really had his roots in this understanding that the Messiah, as I mentioned, was going to come and again set the Jewish people free from this rule and reign that they had been experiencing under the Romans. Um, actually, Judas wanted Jesus to turn the Romans' world upside down. And uh, Judas had great expectations for a Messiah to restore the kingdom of Israel. That's what he was expecting, more of a political figure to come and turn things upside down. But as Judas spent more and more time with Jesus, he came to learn that this just wasn't the way that things were going to go. I mean, he really thought that Jesus could bring restored freedom and a new hope, and he would do those things, but not in the way that Judas expected. So for this first snapshot, let's pick up with John 6. And I talked about this pretty in depth last Sunday, so I'll just touch on it briefly here. In John 6, we see Jesus feed over 5,000 people. Because remember, the Bible tells us there were 5,000 men in attendance. That doesn't account for all the women and children who were there with those men. And he fed all of them with five loaves of bread and two fish. That's it. Meals for everybody, bellies full. Really cool miracle. However, Judas and others were blown away by, in John 6, 14 through 15, it says, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. But then what did he do? He didn't stand there and say, hey, look at how fantastic I am. Look at what I just did for you. Instead, he actually slipped away into the hills by himself. Strange. Not what they expected. Definitely an upside-down expectation for the Messiah. As we explored a bit last week, perhaps Judas stood there in the middle of his great expectations and thought to himself, maybe, this is totally conjecture, what a missed opportunity to harness a huge following, remember, over 5,000 people, all the way to glory in Jerusalem, like said Judas, maybe. What were you thinking, Jesus, right? That was his mindset. And we don't know that he said that, but his actions continuing on from this point would show that he probably was thinking that way. Judas may have gone to sleep that night, shaking his head in disbelief of what he had experienced. However, the next day, when he heard Jesus teaching the crowds of Jews concerning his own body being the bread of life and his blood being necessary for eternal life, it was totally mind-blowing. Again, upside down from the expectations that they had. Like this whole idea in John 6, 60, where the disciples, the people who were gathering around Jesus to hear what he was going to share with them, they were so excited for this new leader to come. And he's talking about himself dying. It's like, wait a minute, how can you lead us in a revolution if you're dead? That doesn't make any sense. 
And so ultimately we read in John 6, 60 that many of his disciples, many of his followers said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And we hear that still today, right? People who hear about Jesus and they think to themselves, what? That's crazy. Blood, bread, juice. What are we doing here? I know it sounds so odd. That's exactly how his followers felt at that point in time. And the sad part is, you know what ended up happening was the confusion led to the disciples starting to complain. And in John 6, 61 through 64, we read the Bible telling us that Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. And so he said to them, what, does this offend you? Like this truth that I'm sharing? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man, referring to himself, ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. What I'm telling you about what we will know later as communion, this is truth. This is what I'm giving to you. I know it's crazy, but that's the point. You follow what seems crazy, and then you see it work out for good in all circumstances, and then you know that the faith you have had is real. But you have to trust first. And that's the really hard part, right? And so he said, but some of you, you just don't believe me. You just don't believe. And now the momentum from the masses was walking away, literally. So here Jesus, when he was feeding everybody, meeting all their needs on the outside, all those physical needs, they were all about following him, all about listening to everything he had to say. But then when he started to talk about matters of the heart, and changing mindset. The people got weirded out by that, and they walked away. John 6, 66 says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Deserted him. That's a strong word. To desert someone is to just totally leave them high and dry, like done with you. That's discouraging for a leader. A second snapshot that gives us a glimpse into the moment that may have stung Judas while flying over the heads of the rest of the twelve is this idea that they gathered together and Jesus said to those who remain, because remember, as we follow this really crucial story leading up to Easter, Jesus is meeting with his core people, his core twelve, and he's saying to them, hey guys, literally guys, I'm going to equip you for ministry, because I'm not always going to be here to do it with you, right? So it's that whole idea of, a friend of mine likes to call it decentralized command. So this whole idea that you are equipping your subordinates to be able to do the work for you when you can't be there. Okay, we see it in Jesus. This is what he's trying to do. And so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Like, are you leaving too? Or are you here to stay? And as we go on, Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? No, you, you are the man, he says. He says, you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Yeah, he gets it. And Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet, and yet, one of you is the devil. Wow, he that stinks, right? That's hard to hear. This is what I'm talking about, that snapshot, that second snapshot, that the enemy had already been planting seeds in Judas's mind. This did not help the cause, okay? This idea that Judas was beginning to really question. The fact that Jesus is calling him out, I'm sure was not lost on him. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Jesus knew this. He knew this, and he wanted so much to give Judas the opportunity, we can assume, to repent, to stop, to say, no, Jesus, I'm sorry. This is what I'm thinking in my head. This is the battle that I'm fighting inside my mind. Help me. But the story goes on. You know, we, we don't know for sure 
what was going on inside the head of, and mind of, of Judas. But we can see this story play out and know that he was really wrestling with what to do with these temptations that he was facing. Because, see, the devil got a foothold in Judas's heart and mind. The devil got a foothold. And when the devil gets a foothold, he doesn't just leave it at that. No, he wants to just crash right on through into people's hearts and minds and lives and ruin everything. That's his goal. And so as we go on in this, this story, we see another snapshot that just really, again, frustrated Judas. We see six days before the Passover in John 12, where Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. Now, Lazarus, separate story for another time, was dead, and Jesus raised him from the dead. Like, whoa, pretty amazing, right? And so they gave a dinner for him because Mary and Martha were like, whoa, you just saved our brother from death, so we're going to make you dinner. That makes sense, right? So Jesus comes on in, and Mary, instead of helping with preparations for the dinner, which kind of frustrated her sister Martha a little bit, but Mary said, you know what? Jesus, you are amazing. I need to come at your feet. And this really expensive bottle of perfume that my family has been saving that's worth a whole lot of money. And keep in mind, the, the apostles were around at this time, so Judas was there. Mary says, Jesus, I, I just want to dump this perfume on your feet and wash your feet with this perfume. And then even she got down on her hands and knees and used her long hair to even like rub in the perfume. Now that's, that's symbolism of, of love. Just absolutely grateful love for what Jesus did in saving her brother's life. And just the aura of peace around this man, it really made the devil mad. And see, the devil had gotten that foothold, like we said, in the heart and mind of Judas, so it wasn't a far leap for Judas, who was in charge of holding the money for the cause, to get really frustrated with what Mary was doing. Because that money, that perfume being dumped out onto Jesus, wouldn't that have been much better in his pocket, right? Here, take this. Take this, basically, treasurer for the cause that Jesus is leading, the ministry. Take this and use it. And then he could have gotten some money from it, right? But no, when she dumps it on his feet, it's gone. And in his mind, it was a complete waste. Again, upside down expectations. He's thinking, what are you doing? And Jesus, how are you letting her do that? Scripture tells us, actually, that Judas says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? See, he's trying to make it seem like he cares about the poor. But as we go on, we know that Jesus actually um, is aware because he says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. This whole idea that he's saying, look, I'm going to die. He knew this was coming, and it was confirmed by things like what Judas just did. Because Jesus knew, remember, that Judas was the one who would betray him. And so when Judas was frustrated by what Mary was doing to, in essence, worship Jesus, it was just another basically cementing of the fact in Jesus' mind that Judas was headed down the devil's path. And so as we continue... In this, we understand that the other followers of Jesus, the other disciples who were there, they didn't know this about Judas. It wasn't until after the fact, it wasn't until Judas betrayed Jesus that they really understood and were able to piece back all the pieces of the puzzle, put them together in retrospect. So here, they're not seeing it. They're not seeing the signs that one of them, Judas, is going to betray Jesus. But Jesus knows. 
Jesus knows. Matthew's account of the same scene that we just described um, says this, Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? So this was his next move after seeing that perfume totally wasted. He went and they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. It was cemented for Judas at that point. He was there with all of them. He saw the wastefulness. And because money was involved and it was a wastefulness of money, greed was his downfall sin. That's what caused him to totally turn away from Jesus. The fact that Mary was so focused on worshiping and, in his opinion, squandering what should have been his to control. The Passover meal would prove to be that final snapshot when Judas would make his move that would seal his fate leading to eternal regret rather than a missed opportunity of repentance. You know, at any point, if Judas had said, Jesus, this is what I'm thinking about doing and I'm so sorry, would you please help me to stop myself? Redeem me, Father. Redeem me and save me, Lord. He didn't, though. Right? He continued on the path of frustration and anger toward Jesus. Resentment built. And so, ultimately... In John 13, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Remember, this isn't the first time that he's made this claim. So his, his disciples are beginning to feel like, what is going on? Like something is really about to happen here. Scripture tells us, truly, truly, I say to you, as I just mentioned, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Like, what? how could we betray him? John, find out. How, who is he referencing? And so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, likely John, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. The betrayal had been made known. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. No one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Interesting, right? Here we're seeing two different levels of understanding in the group that was there. John and Simon Peter must have been aware of something that was going on there. And because of the, the kind of whispers and feelings of, what? wait, he just said somebody's going to betray him. Who is it? Who could it be? Is it me? No. Who could it be? But then others were just saying, oh, okay, yeah, Judas just left because he's going to buy more food or, you know, he, it's time for him to go. But they didn't put all the pieces together at that time. And rather than repenting in the moment and moving into the light, Judas decides to heed influence from the evil one instead and move deeper into the darkness. We see this happen, right? People think that they're just so far gone, there's no way that they can come back. I'm this far gone into the darkness, I might as well just finish it off. I have to say to you this morning, it does not have to be like that. Up until our last breath, it is not too late to truly repent for the wrong that we have done. And I know that seems really, really extreme. Overly generous. But this is the love of our Lord. This is the truth of what the gospel tells us. This is why Jesus ultimately allowed the betrayal to play out. 
so that he could be sacrificed for you and for me. It's really powerful when you take the time to, to think about what self-sacrifice means. Because that's what Jesus embodied. As we continue on, this whole idea of that signaling, um, that signaling of scooping the bread in this meal that they just shared with the topping of either meat or oils for dipping and then giving it to Judas. This would have been viewed as a sign of deep and intimate friendship and respect from a host to a guest. In this gesture, Jesus was reaching out to Judas one last time. And yes, it was a signaling to those who were in on that, that kind of inner secret of this would be the sign of who was going to betray him. But it was also a way for Jesus to communicate to Judas that it was not too late that their friendship went deeper, that the love that Jesus had for Judas went deeper than whatever the enemy was trying to work in his heart and head. Nonetheless, Judas crossed over the line of no return when he went from the room full of friends and into the night. Now, don't miss the fact that all the disciples around the table at the time really did not have a good sense for what was underway. They did not understand that Jesus truly was going to die. They didn't grasp that. I'm sure they were still thinking that it was a metaphor. They, they didn't understand that this was really going to happen. That when he talked before and they were so confused about the body and the blood, that he truly meant what he was saying. One can only wonder what might have happened had Judas seized the moment and called on Jesus for help in defeating the voice of Satan in his head, what could his life have been like if he had not let the enemy win? How might Jesus have turned things around for Judas? How might he turn things around for us? Those of us who think, again, that we're just so far gone, there's no coming back. There is always a way to come back until our final moment on this earth. There is an opportunity to choose something different that does not stop until life stops. It is not too late to turn to Jesus and be sincerely sorry for what we have done wrong or have failed to do right. Because if you know what's right and you fail to do it, that's a sin. It's not only a sin to do the wrong things, it's also a sin to know what's right and not do it. I know I have been guilty of that sin. I have to ask God every single day to help me to be a better person for him. For him first. And that trickles down, right? Because when we're good with Jesus first, that makes us better for our spouse, for our children, for our friends, for our family members, for our co-workers, for our community members. When we put the Lord first in our lives, everything else falls into place. If we don't, we set ourselves up to carry an unbearable load. And that is exactly what happened to Judas. Judas is proof of that fact. He allowed himself to be overtaken by greed and evil. And as we read in Matthew 26, while he was still speaking, Judas came. This was in the garden. One of the twelve. And with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Because remember, remember Judas agreed that he would sell Jesus to them for 30 pieces of silver. Remember after he was so frustrated over that wastefulness that Mary demonstrated. He went and decided that the life of Jesus was worth 30 pieces of silver. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. Rabbi, greetings, teacher. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus 
and seized him. He had been sold. Judas soon would regret. He would come to his senses and realize that his actions were wrong. He would have seller's remorse. I'd like to take a moment now and have us watch a monologue from a character playing Judas. Now, I want you to understand that the Bible is true. The Bible is real. The Bible is a historical document. This story happened. This man named Judas lived, followed Jesus, and then betrayed him for real. What we're about to watch gives us an idea of how this may have played out in his mind. So let's just take a few moments and then we'll come back together. I thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. There was a party and we were all, we were all there and, and some woman comes in and she has a bottle of perfume, a, a expensive perfume and she just pours it all over him. She did that because she thought he was the one. What a waste. We could have sold that perfume and used the money for a greater purpose. I tried to tell him as much. But he came back at me insinuating that he was the purpose. Even so, I believed he was the one. I believed that he was gonna turn everything upside down. I, 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 just, I just knew it. I mean, people would have followed him anywhere. All he had to do was just say the word, but he wouldn't say the word. Instead, he, my time has not yet come. That's what he would say over and over to me. My time has not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was healing the blind, producing food out of thin air. My time has not yet come. So I forced his hand. I made his time come. Things needed to push, and I was the only one that had the courage to do it. We were all up there eating. We were all up there. He looks across the table to me, and he says, get on with it. How, how did he know what I was going to do? It wasn't about the money. It was not about the money. It's just when you have that kind of power that he has, why wouldn't you leverage it to forward, to forward the agenda? People listen to him. You know the sound a wave makes after it hits the shore? And how quiet it gets after a few seconds when it stops. That was Jesus. When he spoke, it was like a, a rolling wave. And the crowds listening They were the hush at the end of the wave. Because when he spoke and you were there in his presence, there was no doubt in anyone's mind he was the one. I done it's really 
interesting, right, to think about getting into the mind of Judas. That's a scary place to be. That's a sad place to be. At the end of that video, you saw that Judas realized he had betrayed the one, the Messiah. And he was so overwhelmed with his grief and remorse that he was about to do something that could never be reversed. Matthew continues the story that when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief, chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Please take this back. I don't want it. I was wrong. I really messed up. They said, what is that to us? See to, see it, see to it yourself, they said. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. He took his own life because he could not bear what he had done. The enemy used him to do his dirty work. And by the time Judas realized it, it was too late, he thought, for redemption. And so he took his own life and lost the opportunity to fix what he had done wrong. So sad. Such a sad and morbid ending to one who held so much promise when Jesus first called him to follow as one of the twelve. But Judas never could get the right perspective and the proper expectations of who Jesus was, who the Messiah was supposed to be. See, what Jesus was doing wasn't fitting the mold of what he expected. No, Jesus turned his world upside down. And instead of trusting in something he could not understand at that time, he stuck to his own agenda, his own plan. See, he walked with Jesus closer than anyone, right? Those 12 were right there with Jesus. Just because we walk physically with some symbol of our faith. We carry a Bible. We have a phone with a version app on it. We have a Bible on our bookshelves. It doesn't mean that we truly understand who Jesus is for each one of us. The physical closeness does not replace the closeness of the heart and the head. Judas didn't get that far. Jesus wanted him to. Jesus offered it multiple times. But physical nearness to Jesus does not ensure life change from the inside out. And see, that's the part that's so important. One can seem to walk with Jesus to fly the flag, right? and not have their life turned right side up as God intended. They could be very upside down. Judas is proof that just because one associates with Jesus, it does not mean that a person's life has been changed for eternity by salvation through Jesus. There is a difference. We're not even in church this morning, right? I'm inside my house talking to you. We don't need a building with symbols and crosses, and we don't need any of that stuff to be able to understand the closeness that we can have with Jesus Christ. I want to be able to feel close to my Savior in my heart and in my head first, then come the symbols of my cross and a sign that says simply blessed and the things that we put around us 
the crosses that we put in our churches and the other symbols, they have to come after what's first and foremost important, and that is the heart condition. That is the heart condition. And see, that's where Judas was just so torn, so confused, because his heart was being pulled by the enemy and by Jesus. And because Judas's head expected that political savior, the enemy was able to pull Judas's heart in his direction. Judas went his own way, and it led him down a sad path. Jesus did the will of the Father as a result of it, though, and gained all who call on Jesus' name to be saved from their sins. You see how something that was really bad news for Judas ended up becoming the best news ever for us. May we see clearly who Jesus the Messiah truly is this Easter season. As we seize the great expectations of eternal life that are produced from the cross, may we not miss the opportunity to find forgiveness of our sins in the sacrificial death of Jesus. It's there for us. That is what Easter is all about, not candy and bunnies. It's about the cross and what happened there. It's about everlasting life and peace on this earth because we know Jesus. In God's design, that's what makes the betrayal and subs subsequent sacrifice worthwhile. Is that we, we get to have peace on this earth and life everlasting because of the pain that Jesus endured on that cross. What the devil intended for evil, God used for good. The good news is that it doesn't have to be too late for us to embrace the one, Jesus. It's too late for Judas. Could we learn from his mistakes? And as you're sitting in your living room or your kitchen or wherever you are, I don't even know if we really know each other, but I want you to know that right now, I'm praying for you to have an open heart and an open mind like you've never had before. I promise you, you will not regret it if you let Jesus into your life. You will see changes. The more you let God into your world, you will be able to find peace in your marriage, with your children, with your family members, and there's a lot of closeness going on right now, isn't there? Close proximity, right? In our homes, here we are. There's no better time to ask Jesus for help than when we're all stuck in, at home together. Let's let God use it as a blessing and turn what the devil wants to use for evil into good to glorify his name. I'd love to pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather. I don't know how many people were touched by this message today, but I'm praying, Father, that everyone who did join us heard your message for them. Because you do that, Lord. You come into each of our lives and you take pieces of this story. And you have those pieces that need to resonate with each one of us, you have those stick with us. And so, Father, I pray that for everyone who joined in on this today, that we would really reflect on what you have for us in the form of a takeaway. I pray that if we don't yet have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, that we would really be seeking you this Easter season. That, that we would continue to gather together in this format, as we explore how you can turn people's expectations upside down. Father, for those who do have a relationship with your, your son, Jesus Christ, oh, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that we can hear this message and know your truth and know your peace. I pray that you would help us, even as we are tested, to know that you will win. You have won the war. Yeah, the battles, the enemy is still trying to win, but Father, you can take those too if we let you. Father God, help us to take that next step to grow closer to you and 
somehow to each other, even in this time of social distancing. May we have spiritual closening. That's really not a word, but may we come closer to you. Father, thank you so much for technology allowing us to be able to still meet. It's a blessing, and we will capitalize on it as much as we possibly can to glorify your name. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. I'll see you next week. So we've come to our time for gifts and the offering. We're aware that church looks different, and we want to encourage you to explore and make yourself comfortable with online giving and embracing how this looks. Even though church does look different, we still have expenses. As we have all seen in the last few weeks, our community has needs that we are called to help and support. Our mission has not changed. We still desire to be the church, and your gifts and offerings drive that. You will see the link for online giving in the comments below, or you can go directly to www.cbfree.church backslash giving. Please take time to consider at home and to explore our website. There are many ways to stay connected to your church family. On the website, we can treat it as a virtual connect card where you share pray prayers, praises, send messages to leadership, and even update your contact info. Other ways the website can be used is to revisit today's message along with past messages. CBFree.Church is also full of resources for you and your friends and family. Sharing the website and today's live stream are both ways, are both ways that you can invite your friends and family to join us and to share the new thing that God is doing in our community. This is a concept that we can share during these challenging times, that God is doing a new thing and embrace it. One of the ways you can do that is to share today's service on social media and invite your friends and family to explore how God is doing this new thing through our Facebook, Instagram, and the website. Please join us this week in the Gospel of Mark study page on Facebook by going to CV Free Church Gospel of Mark study on Facebook and enjoy, I'm sorry, and join us next week at CV Free Church here on Facebook. Now we'll ask Pastor John to pray for us as we close this time. Church, as we get ready to wrap up today, I just want to uh, ask that we would bow our heads and, and lift a praise to Jesus. Uh, Father God, as we come to you this week, it's been so challenging as, as, as Kathy has said, this new thing that you're doing. And Father, church looks different to us now, and we're not really sure how, how to react to this. And so Father, we just ask that you would continue to guide us, that you would set our path, that you would show us how to be salt and light out in our communities that are looking darker and less flavorful these days, Father. Uh, we know that the church is not a building, but, but it's your people who are called to do your will. And so, Father, we just ask that you would set a fire in each one of us that shows us uh, the path that you would have marked for us. Give us opportunities that we can be brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can uh, be salty in our communities, that we can uh, take a light into the workplace if we're somebody who has uh, a job where we are still... Uh, being asked to go on the front lines each day, Father. Let us sh share our hope that we have in you, Father. Let us just embrace those people who are going through hardships. Let us be a shoulder to lean on for other people. Father, we just don't know what's gonna happen with this new thing, but we do know that you brought us to it, which means that you will bring us through it. And so, Father, we just ask that you continue to uh, embolden us, to strengthen us, and Father, continue to forge us in the path that you would have. Father, let us continue to build your kingdom and let us build it right here in our communities and around us in our small gathering places. Father, you have made us for a time such as this. And so we just ask that you would come and continue to bless this new thing that you're doing with us, through us, and to us. Father, we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have a blessed week, church. Yes, have a blessed week. Thank you.